Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegulu. Now, let's be clear about this. The United States did have a colony of sorts in West Africa, although a myriad of factors have served to rather blur that notion of a conquering America on the shores of the West African subcontinent. The colony was Liberia, a territory that was established as a homeland for freed slaves by the US. That at least was the original motivation, but there were other important factors such as fear of slave revolts, concern for the growing dependency on slave labor, and of course colonial ambitions. And those colonial ambitions became the dominant factor that motivated the US to strengthen its foothold in Liberia during European colonialism, and the country became a place from where Washington could project its interests into other parts of Africa. The US Firestone Company established one of the world's largest rubber plantations in Liberia as a direct response to the British rubber monopoly. And in the decades to follow, the American government put in place a number of important military facilities in Liberia, such as a deep sea port, an airport, numerous military bases and training camps, and the largest U.S. embassy in Africa, as well as intelligence relay stations and navigation systems. All of this and more are captured in a new book titled Two Centuries of U.S. Military Operations in Liberia, Challenges of Resistance, and compliance. And to further examine the factors that shaped Liberia and the country's colonial ties with the US, I'm joined now by the author of that new book, Dr. Niels Hahn. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Hahn, for joining us. Now, uh, the United Nations humanitarian, uh, rather sorry, first of all, summarize for us um, your book um, and, and why you decided to write it. Well, um, it goes back uh, to around 2002. Uh, at that point, I knew very little about Liberia, but I was uh, going to Liberia to work for a humanitarian organization. And um, before arriving, I read what I could find about Liberia, uh, trying to figure out what was the causes of the conflicts uh, and the wars, who were involved in it and so on. Um, and it appeared in most of the literature and reports from different organizations, as this was a, a, a very uh, typical civil war, uh, African civil war, um, where external powers were not involved. Uh, but after I arrived, uh, it uh, became evident very quickly, everybody knew in Liberia that the US was deeply involved in this war and was behind the war. Uh, but outside Liberia, there was very little knowledge about this. Um, so uh, later on, I decided to, uh, to do a, a research uh, on this and also trying to, uh, to find out how a, a major power can be so obviously involved in a, in a, in a war in Africa um, and uh, outside that country, uh, nobody writes about it, nobody talks about it, there's a silence uh, around that. And um, uh, that was uh, very strange to me. Uh, so I decided to to uh, uh, to go into the details and 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 uh, and write uh, write a book on, on this and and uh, and really trying to figure out what is happening because Liberia is not uh, the only case. It's just an example. We see similar uh, things going on in many other places in Africa. Well, that's very interesting what you say there. Uh, you said you set out to find out what was behind all this. What did you find out? Well, um, well, it was very obvious that, that the, this was not a, what I would consider as a, a civil war. This was an international war uh, where you had the major powers involved in it. You had France deeply involved in Ivory Coast. Uh, you had the Britain deeply involved in Sierra Leone, United States in Sierra Leone, in, in Liberia. Um, and uh, although they had their own uh, kind of semi-colonial or neo-colonial interest, they also had a inter-imperial rivalry in that part of West Africa. Um, but, um, but what I found really strange was that it can be so obvious when being in the, those countries and, and, and doing research on it, but there's so little written on it. 
Um, and I think it's very important to look uh, deeper into the details of how uh, are these systems constructed. Uh, so uh, I got a lot of inspiration in uh, Ghana's first president, uh, his work, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, he wrote a lot on neocolonialism and um, that then became one of my main uh, uh, areas of research uh, to look at how does this system operate today uh, and how can we see through the hist historical perspective, how can we understand what's going on today in, in Africa, uh, particularly in areas of armed conflicts and uh, the problems of and challenges of, of development. Well, absolutely. The history, obviously crucial to understanding what, what's going on. And of course, uh, as you captured in your book, the founding of Liberia was also significant because it marked the beginning of long-term U.S. military involvement in, in West Africa, which is partly what your book is about. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, to begin with, I, I wanted mainly to focus on the recent wars from around uh, uh, the 1980s and onward. But I realized that in order to understand what happened there, you had to go another 20 years back and in order to understand what happened there, you had to go another 50 years back and so on and so forth. So I ended back to around uh, the uh, around uh, the slave trade uh, and the economic systems in the US um, and, and uh, which then became, first of all, why Liberia was established um, because what the mainstream history shows often that it was established for, as, a, as a land for, for the freed slaves uh, from the US and it was presented as a philanthropic project. Uh, but the reality was that um, it was not a very philanthropic project. It was a problem of slave rebellions in the United States. And the slave owners and the US government needed to dispose those uh, so-called problematic rebellious slaves and find a place to where they could send them. And that is very obvious. Uh, uh, when you look into the, into the archives and look at the primary resources, but if you read the mainstream history written by mainly US history historians, it's presented very differently. So um, the reality of the funding of Liberia and the way presented in the history is very different. Interesting. And of course, um, as, as all this was taking place uh, with the United States and slavery and all that, there was also colonialism, which was much more of a European thing, uh, the, the Europeans colonizing many parts of Africa. And um, I wonder if it could be said that the United States also wanted a piece of that colonial action that the Europeans were clearly enjoying in Africa. So w w was there that great power rivalry and some pressure on the United States to also get in on the action? Um, yes, and, and this is a very interesting and, and central uh, uh, area uh, because the, the, the U.S. Uh, wanted a colony in Africa. Uh, but uh, uh, the issue here that's very important to keep in mind is that they wanted, did not want to spend that much money on it. Um, and they looked at the neighboring uh, uh, Sierra Leone and they looked at how expensive it was to administrate Sierra Leone as a crown colony of the, the United Kingdom. So the United States wanted to do it in a cheaper way and therefore do it more indirectly without deploying the full administration of American administrators, but trying to use um, uh, local people to organize and form the government, but make sure that people in government would comply with the wishes of the United States government. And um, that turned out to be more uh, challenging uh, because there was a lot of resistance from, uh, from both local people and also those uh, uh, freed slaves that were sent to Liberia. Uh, so it has been very difficult for, for the United States to, to maintain a, a stable country, although they did succeed for many years, but from the 1970s and onwards, when the Pan-African ideas became more influential, um, and also heavily influenced by the work of Kwame Nkrumah and uh, when he uh, conceptualized and identified the modalities of neocolonialism, the resistance uh, in Liberia became quite strong. Um, and that's where we, see, we saw 
some of the root causes of of the uh, uh, of the recent uh, conflicts in Liberia. That's a fascinating history, and and just returning to the big theme of your book. Uh, which is military involvement, U.S. military involvement in, in Liberia. You argue that that involvement was necessary not only to secure the land that became Liberia from the local population, but also because of Liberia's strategic location and its access to a deep water port in West Africa. Yes, absolutely. Um, that was that was very important too. Um, uh, there are many discussions and different views on this, but much indicates that this became uh, further down uh, in the, uh, or, or later up in the history, where first of all the problems was to find a place to uh, to to send those uh, rebellious uh, slaves here from the United States. Then second, more interest came when first they had secured the land on the West African coast. Um, and no doubt that was officially uh, an American colony. It was also established by the society that was called the American Colonization Society. Um, it wasn't before around 30 years later that they decided to, uh, uh, to have it more of what we would identify today as a neo-colonial structure. Uh, that then uh, uh, comes from the 19, uh, around the 1950s um, and then from there, that system develops uh, of different interests that then grows over the years and, and throughout history. Okay, well, I mean, it's a very interesting story, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hand. Uh, we, we obviously a lot to talk about. I mean, we're going to take a break in a minute, but when we come back, I want to talk about another very important aspect of, um, of all this, which is uh, and that's an important aspect of colonialism in any case, uh, which is the economic involvement of, of the U.S. in Liberia and also how this inevitably led to the creation of a ruling class and also created inequities um, within Liberian society, which eventually, of course, led to a conflagration and, and a civil war. Uh, stay with us. Uh, you're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Dr. Niels Hahn, author of Two Centuries of U.S. Military Operations in Liberia. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Enyagoldo. Now, the role of a major external colonizing power, such as the United States in West Africa, is an important issue that's long been ignored. But details of this have now emerged in a new book by Dr. Niels Hahn, who is my guest today. The country in question is Liberia. And Dr. Hahn, uh, his new book, dispels the notion that the U.S. was one Western country that had no colonial ties to Africa. The reports you see don't always tell the whole story, certainly not about Liberia, which is described as a hidden U.S. colony in West Africa. The relationship between Washington and Monrovia is to say the least complicated, but it has everything to do with racism and colonization. And the new book by Dr. Hans provides an in-depth analysis of the factors that shaped Liberia from its founding to the present day and the inextricable part U.S. involvement has played in that history. And Dr. Niels Hahn, author of Two Centuries of U.S. Military Operations in Liberia, Challenges of Resistance and Compliance, is still with me via WebEx. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Uh, and we were talking uh, before we went on the break about the economic involvement, which is always a major factor in colonization, Firestone, moving in to develop rubber plantations, massive plantations that required huge amounts of labor and eventually resulting in a system of forced labor, which was in fact pretty much like the way slavery that the U.S. had sent free slaves to get away from um, was, was set up. Um, yes, you, you rightly so. Um, yes, in, in one way, it could be seen as uh, 
as the uh, the this uh, the plantation the, the, the slave uh, uh, labor plantation system was replicated in um, uh, in Liberia by Firestone. Um, although uh, they called it uh, they did not call it uh, slave labor, but it was forced labor. If you look into the details on how that took place and the lines between forced labor and slave labor uh, are very difficult. Uh, and also today, there have been many problems uh, with Firestone and uh, the use of, uh, of, of labor in the plantations. So they've been accused of also using, uh, uh, establishing a system that forces children also to, to work in the plantation for, uh, in order to support the families because the quota of the rubber they have to collect are so high uh, that they do need to, uh, parents need to use the, the children as well. Um, this is very controversial and it's going on today. So in some ways uh, we could say that uh, little has changed uh, throughout history. And I think that's why history is so important uh, to understand because we can see how things continues, although it's developed in new shapes and new forms, uh, it becomes clearer when we have the historical perspective. Uh, and of course, inevitably, uh, Dr. Hahn, a ruling class was created and inequalities became more apparent, didn't they? Um, yes, uh, inequalities uh, existed in, in many ways uh, and, and changed uh, over history. Um, the ruling class uh, were not a, a, a single uh, homogeneous cry, uh, class. It was also uh, structured uh, internally. And um, many of the people in the ruling class did not comply with the wishes of Washington. So it was a quite unstable system for, for, uh, for, for the United States uh, government uh, for many years. And mainly it was just stable for around 1930s to around 19, uh, early 1970s during the uh, administration of, uh, of President uh, Topman. Uh, then when he died and uh, Talbot uh, came into power, who also would be considered as belonging to the ruling class, things changed significantly because uh, Talbot was influenced by uh, the uh, Pan-African ideas and in particular by uh, Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah. And uh, there we saw the resistance in Liberia increase significantly uh, in Liberia. And that's where the United States started to lose control over the, uh, over the, uh, the country. And that's also from where I would say that the uh, recent uh, conflicts uh, starts from the 1970s. Uh, the United States then had uh, Talbot removed uh, in 1980. And the way in which they did that is detailed in the book. And I think it's very important to, uh, to study that because we see many similar uh, things going on today in, in different countries where the same techniques are applied. Uh, for example, how civil society organizations can be organized and mobilized uh, against the government, how uh, information warfare propaganda uh, is, uh, is very crucial uh, in, in making uh, making a, a change of, of government uh, if they do not uh, comply with uh, with Washington. Uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's that, that's a very interesting point that you bring up because I was gonna because I mean you had these ethnic rivalries and then you had the assassination of President Talbert. Um, you had unstable government, and then you had a devastating civil war. I mean, did all this happen as a result of a deteriorating relationship with the U.S., or was Washington complicit in sowing the seeds of discord and helping them to flourish as part of its Liberia policy of command, control, and compliance? Um, yes, in, indeed. I, I think it's the same old colonial strategy of divide and rule. Uh, you need to have uh, divisions uh, in different levels of, of society so you can set different groups up against each other uh, and therefore but direct them in a way that, uh, that it benefits uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the imperial power. Um, and I think we can see these strategies have been applied from, from the very early, early uh, um, empires. 
Um, and uh, well, yeah, it, it changed throughout history the way it does because uh, the techniques and technologies and, and information flows and so on are changing. And therefore, uh, the way in which it takes place is changing. But uh, fundamentally, the basic principles uh, are still the same and, and that is still going on today. And uh, Dr. Hahn, I read one review that said that one of the great strengths of your book is its ability to weave together all these competing factors to explain not only U.S. involvement in Liberia, but how that impacted on political developments that shaped Liberia. I mean, that must have been quite a task for you. Um, yes. Uh, yes, it, it also took took, took many years uh, to weave this this together and also get an overview of, of a very complicated history, not least because a lot of the history that has been written on Liberia uh, has a particular uh, political angle, and also, uh, as we know, history is often often written by. Uh, by, 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 the, by, by the strongest powers and, and, uh, and those uh, who controls the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the means to, uh, to write the history. Um, so that makes it more complicated because there's so much distorted history about Liberia uh, out there. Uh, so that was complicated. The, the, one, of the, one of the main themes, I, I would say, that has been excluded largely from the history is the issue of industrialization. And that's something we, we, we see across Africa. Um, uh, when countries seems to uh, embark on industrialization policies, then the former colonial powers becomes quite uh, concerned. Um, and if we link that into the different development theories, we can see that uh, in order to increase uh, a nation's power, uh, you must have a strong industrial base. Uh, an industrial base will then support the national power. The national power will make it more difficult for external powers to control those national powers. Uh, so industrialization policy seems to be very central. And uh, in the 1970s, Liberia was embarking on, on, on industrial, very right. strong. Okay, uh, I'm really uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Dr. Hahn. A fascinating story, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. I wanted to get to one colonizer, the U.S., being replaced by another, China, but unfortunately we're out of time. But uh, Dr. Uh, Niels Hahn, I want to thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and elsewhere. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.